I, I wanted to start with a broad, a broad question and a broad topic. Um, sort of the cultural value of basic behavioral ecology research and what that is. But I'll ask you, start off in a specific sort of way. Um, in preparation for this, I, I listened to and looked up a bunch of interviews that you did about your latest book, Paleo Fantasy, which is, of course, about sort of uh, how evolution works and specifically how human evolution has worked and how people use that to sort of um, justify actions and, and, and sort of stances on what they do and yeah. sort of human behavior. And every time you, it seems like in a lot of your interviews, you, you always sort of link it back to being inspired by your cricket research and sort of rapid evolution that you saw in the field in Hawaii. And you always sort of tie it back to that as, as sort of, um, well, I was doing this research and I got into this literature and then it got me thinking about these cultural issues and therefore there's this book. So I wonder if, if to you, um, that your latest book is sort of a culmination of your latest research thread. Do you see it as that? So I've always been interested in the way people think about evolution and animal behavior and how it affects their lives. And I think you can't work in behavior without having lots of people ask you questions about things they see in their pets or stuff they hear. And when you link it to evolution, everybody's got, and particularly evolution in relation to sex and, uh, you know, mating behavior, which is what I work on, you always end up with these questions that have to do with, you know, what human nature is. So, for example, are people naturally monogamous or is monogamy doomed is actually really the way people mostly put it, uh, that, you know, isn't it true that just because of biology uh, that men are destined to want to cheat on their spouses or, you know, something like that, or they'll want to know whether homosexuality is natural. And so I've always been interested, and I think all of my books reflect for the public reflect this, I've always been interested in how people take information about science and apply it to their own lives. And I'm particularly interested in how people do that with sex and gender and with evolution. So I think that's more where the the books come from. But it is true that that's also what I'm into. Sex, gender, and evolution is kind of what I'm interested in in my research, too. Mm -hmm. Do you think do you think for behavioral ecology, for basic behavior, like, you know, research on sexual selection in crickets or parasite loads in crickets or something like that, do you think if you're doing that kind of work, it's sort of a, a an onus on you to to have some sort of public communication part of that research? Like, because behavioral ecology is sort of an esoteric thing, right? I mean, I'm sure people have always asked you why, why? Why would the government, why would NSF pay for it? Oh, yeah. Know? I mean, we've just, that, that was actually a big topic at the International Society for Behavioral Ecology meeting that I was just at in New York City, where um, Patty Brennan, who's at UMass Amherst, was talking about this really vicious attack that her research on duck genitalia got from um, Congress and then from a lot of conservative media who, you know, really picked up on this whole, oh, well, you know, why is my tax, why are my tax dollars paying for someone who wants to look at a duck penis? And, you know, so it became this big, you know, joke and, and she was really getting a lot of very personal, um, and extremely vicious attacks for it. And she gave a wonderful talk at the conference where she pointed out a couple of things that I think are, and, and I had actually talked with her about it when all of this was breaking. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, there's a couple of points there that are important. I mean, one of them is absolutely, I think the taxpayers or the government or whoever it is does, um, deserve to find out about what we're doing in terms of research. They're paying for it. They're supporting it. Uh, science is a big part of society. So, so that's absolutely true. But I think that doing behavioral ecology, you run into a couple of problems. One of them is that, and, and I did tell Patty this, that, you know, part of the reason she's getting a lot of flack is that, you know, the senators can pronounce the word duck and they can pronounce the word penis. And mm -hmm. so therefore, you know, they can take that and run with it. There's plenty of esoteric research or research that would sound esoteric to them that they would probably take just as much exception to, but they can't pronounce methionine or, you know, so, or, you know, epigenetic or some other word that would seem completely insane. We had plenary at that meeting from a Nobel Prize winner who started out his talk saying that, well, he tickles worms for a living and basically he tries to understand nervous stimuli and how they work and has made some, well, groundbreaking discoveries 
because of that. And so you can make anything sound kind of ridiculous. And I think it's in some ways people who do behavioral ecology are a little bit of an easier target than some other people because, again, people know, you know, like even a senator knows the word duck and knows the word penis and just finds it amusing to be able to put those together. But in a, we're not necessarily doing anything that's any more uh unrelated to basic questions than anybody else. So, so that's one point is that they just find us an easier target. The other point, though, is that what we do is answering some incredibly basic questions about life itself. I mean, how can you not want to understand what's responsible for the difference between males and females? You know, how, how can you not think that's an important question? And so we're I think as behavioral ecologists, we're, we're answering a lot of those really important basic questions. The other thing Patty pointed out, and I think this is a really essential thing too, is that, all right, if we're being urged to do not basic, but instead applied research, so we're supposed to be curing cancer, we're supposed to be, uh, you know, solving issues raised, you know, by climate change or what have you, then where does that come from? It, it, and she, you know, had this beautiful pyramid on her slide where she said, well, we've got the big, no, then the bottom two thirds of the pyramid are basic research where you're just trying to answer, you know, as Garrison Keillor would put it, life's persistent questions. Right. Then on top of that, you've got a little chunk called sort of translational research that tries to take that and put it into the very top of the pyramid, which is maybe the top, I don't know, 10% of it, which is really the basic research. But the path from the bottom of that pyramid up to the top is extremely convoluted, and you can never predict from the bottom part what's going to end up with something in the top part. And even the people trying to do translational research, where they're trying to say, all right, I'm going to take this general principle and use it to design a better part stent or to, you know, solve global warming even they are, are kind of shooting in the dark a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So having that big base of the pyramid is completely essential because you just don't know what you're going to need later on. And, and we just couldn't function otherwise. I mean, how could you, no one writes a grant proposal titled curing cancer in, you know, 20 easy steps. It's, it's, it's just not how it works. The the actual I, I'd be willing to bet that those senators who thought the whole thing with the duck penis were ridiculous would have a really hard time sifting through the grant proposals to NIH where you're looking at very fine details of the mechanisms behind gene expression. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder I wonder throughout your career, um, has this do you do you see the current sort of um uh the current struggles along these lines, uh, as, as it greater now than it was in the past or the same, or has this perpetually always been a problem that you've seen? Or? Oh, I, I mean, I think the sort of distrust for basic or, or just ignorance, not even distrust, it's just ignorance about basic research is very, very longstanding. I, I, I gave a, um, I gave a talk at graduation for the College of Creative Studies at UC Santa Barbara where I was uh, an undergrad, uh, and I gave the, the graduation talk uh, a number of years ago, and I told them about uh, something that had happened to me when I had finished my undergrad at UC Santa Barbara. I spent about three years in the, I didn't know what I wanted to do um, mm -hmm. particularly, and I spent about three years having a whole bunch of different jobs, uh, but one of them was I was working for um, a center that was helping uh, students who were viewed as good college prospects, but they had kind of crummy high school backgrounds, and so they were there without a lot of preparation. Uh, and um, most of them were minority students, and they were, you know, at UC Santa Barbara as through through an, an effort to to get more people into into the sciences, basically. And so I was tutoring math and chemistry, and I I remember this still really clearly. And so this was really a long time ago because um, I had finished my undergrad, I hadn't even started my graduate program. Uh, and this uh, uh, guy, his name was Doug, and he came loping across the. Um, campus one day and, you know, uh, wanted to ask me a question. I said, you know, and he said, hey, you know my chemistry class? And I said, sure, yeah, I know your chemistry class. Uh, so how much does that dude make? You know, how much how much does the, the professor make? And I said, I, I don't know, um, you know, I because, I, I mean, I really did, you know, who knew? Yeah. I, like, I had no idea how much professors made. Uh, and uh, I said, why do you want to know? And he said, well, because it seems like this is a pretty amazing job. The guy only teaches three hours a week. In high, you know, my high school classes, my high school teachers were teaching six classes a day, five days a week. And so if this guy's getting paid anywhere close to that, this looks like a pretty sweet thing. And I said, well, you know, in a way it probably is. But at the same time, you know, that the, that your chemistry professor doesn't just teach you. That's not all he does. 
And Doug looked really surprised and said, what else does he do? And I said, well, he does, you know, research to figure out, you know, stuff about chemistry. I mean, like I knew about chemistry. Um, I mean, I'm really, we're, we're really glad, parenthetically, we're really glad Doug did not press me on the details of this guy's research because I had no idea. Mm -hmm. But anyway, and so, so he still looked puzzled. And I said, well, you know, your chemistry book. And I was like, yeah, okay, he knows his chemistry book. I said, how do you think that stuff got in there? And he just looked completely flabbergasted. Was like, what do you mean how it got in there? It didn't get in there. It was just there. Like it was there since, I don't know, it was like the stone tablets. And I said, well, people like your chemistry professor are the people who are responsible for the discoveries that go into that textbook. That's how we know about the way chemistry works. And he, like, I don't even remember the rest of the conversation because I think he was, this was a completely foreign idea to him. And I think that underscores another point about basic research, was, which is that, okay, if people want to tell someone like me, who's a professor at an institution where I do do undergraduate teaching, that, well, I should stop with the, this esoteric research and just, you know, I'm a professor, I should just profess mm -hmm. and I should just teach. Well, then what am I supposed to teach? I guess we could just say, all right, we're putting a moratorium on everybody doing research and I'm just going to teach stuff from what? I don't know. Like, OK, this year is it. Like anything discovered after, you know, you can't discover anything after 2014. It's all going to be, you know, from 2014. I mean, imagine if we had done we could have done that and then no one would have found DNA or they wouldn't have found anything. You know, I mean, so we can't just teach stuff based on something that was what discovered in the Middle Ages. I mean, when are you going to stop this? Knowledge is part of, you know, so people will try and make this distinction between research and education. And what are we teaching them if we're not teaching them about the discoveries that are being made all the time? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I totally agree with you. I don't, I just, it's something I think about yeah. a lot, you know? No, I think, and I just, well, yeah. and I think about it too. It's, and I, I yeah. also think that, that people in my position or our position really should have to think about it and shouldn't just dismiss people who inquire about it as being ignorant or, you know, they just don't know what they're talking about and they just don't know that I'm really doing, you know, no, I mean, it's a legitimate question. Yeah. So, you know, why should someone care about mating behavior in crickets? I mean, I, I'm, I think I, I should be prepared to answer that. And I think there's a number of ways you can answer it. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. And to that point, exactly. Um, I, I really, it, it was sort of, it was sort of, um, amazed a little bit, but also just because you did such a good job of linking those two things, of linking, you know, what you do, um, what your personal research is, and broader questions such as human evolution and how we relate personally to human evolution, to evolution and sort of how evolution happens at different time scales. Um, you know, when you were being interviewed for Paleo Fantasy, no one no one asked you, well, why don't you, why aren't you just a biological anthropologist? Right. <laughs> then they've got a question. Did you ever get that question? You know, I didn't. Um, I think partly because a lot of the, because of the book is, is for a general audience. A lot of the interviewers were not anthropologists. I, I was actually relieved that the anthropologists that I knew many, I'd consulted with a lot of people writing the book because I knew that, you know, you start talking about human stuff and everybody gets way more touchy than if you talk about crickets. Um, and so most of the, the anthropologists that I talked to were, were incredibly gracious and kind about sharing information and seemed to mm -hmm. think what I was doing was, was on the, a reasonably good track. But no, no one's asked me why. I mean, just the same thing as I wrote, I also wrote a book about disease and no one asked me why I'm not an epidemiologist. I mean, I'm interested in that stuff too. But for yeah. me, one of the fabulous things about being interested in evolution is you get to do all kinds of different topics and it all falls under the same general purview. Right, right. Sort of informing a, a, a life view because yeah. that's just the way life works, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, great. Uh, so to backtrack a little bit and get more sort of into your into your your path, which you already sort of mentioned a little bit, um, you're from LA. You grew up in yeah, Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wonder what what for you was. Um, did you have any early impressions of? Oh, like were any of your family members in science or did research or when when did that sort of form that that was a path you could um, take? So, so not at all. I don't come at all from a family of people who were either academics or scientists or anything even close to it. Um, I, I do think that, and I always liked animals as a kid, but if you like animals and you live in a big city, your options for actually 
messing around with animals are pretty limited. And so I did really like bugs when I was a kid. Um, and when, I, when I, so I do have a book on insects and so forth. And I, I think some people, when they interviewed me on that one, got, uh, were really taken with the idea that, you know, there I was, this incredibly, you know, passionate, uh, you know, young budding entomologist, which I don't really feel at all like I was. I think most little kids like animals. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have any animals around other than bugs, then you start liking bugs. And so I, you know, took caterpillars into the house and, fed them and watched them turn into butterflies and did this over and over again. Sometimes it does, you know, kids can do that where, you know, it, you'd think that having a known outcome, I would have gotten tired of it at some point, but I really did do that uh, yeah. for years. And then I just kind of liked insects, but I never, ever connected liking animals or liking much less liking insects with something that you would do for a living. Um, I mean, I, I sort of thought that there were the normal careers of, I don't know, you could be a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. were you did your do you have a family profession no no, no. not really no. Huh. so when you went to you did your undergrad at uc santa barbara yeah did you go yeah. in as a biologist i did um although i had i still wasn't sure about maybe i would be interested in being pre-med um i got disabused of that really qu pretty quickly mm -hmm. uh and um and did was able to start doing some research fairly early on. Uh, part of that was because I was in the College of Creative Studies, which is a separate, it's not really an honors college, but it's sort of a separate, slightly wacky offshoot of the um, of the university. And it provided me with an entree to being able to see what professors were doing and do some field stuff. And plus, because of where Santa Barbara is, it's just such a perfect place for getting more interested in field biology and getting more interested in the natural world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What did you, I did, I read that you did research with Adrian Wenner. Well, so he was one of, he was in the, um, College of Creative Studies and was extremely influential. The, the other thing that was really wonderful about uh, him was that he was the first professor or teacher that I'd ever had who talked about philosophy of science. And I was super excited about this idea that it wasn't just, you didn't just like, okay, here's the experiment, this is what you do, and this is what these people found, but that you thought about how science worked and about science as a way of understanding the world. And he, you know, taught us about Popper and falsifiability, and we read, you know, Thomas Kuhn and the structure of science, scientific revolution. But now that I look back on it, it seems like kind of a strange thing to to do. Um, he taught a class that was for both graduate and undergraduate students, and he let me take it as a sophomore, um, and uh, it was awesome. And he was very interested, partly because he'd been involved in a lot of scientific controversies. He was um, very keen to have people understand the process of science, not just as this unfolding of truths, but as a really messy thing that people, you know, with a lot of stops and starts and disagreements and changes of the way people think and and so forth, but nonetheless, something really worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. So I think that it was it, it, partly it was that he was a big insect fan. Um, and that was hugely inspiring. But also, I think the philosophy of science part was was really uh, exciting for me as well. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, my friend and I were, we we submitted a little proposal to actually do a radio story on on Adrian Winter and sort of the the waggle dance controversy, yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's a really interesting insight into the way that science is sort of a conversation and things there's always the next experiment and there's always things yeah. need to be validified and, and, that it's, and and that it's it's a flawed process and that people you know sometimes will be more devoted to their ideas than they should be and you know yeah 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 that's that's really interesting so he was one of your who were your other mentors in oh uh, as an undergrad um Actually, as someone who was a fungal biochemist named Ian Ross, um, was, uh, also just a big help. And, and I think one of the, one of the things, and I worked in his lab as little as I could because I realized very early on that I just detested doing molecular biology. Um, I, I really didn't like all the fiddly stuff that, you know, one had to do. Although now, ironically, of course, one is, you know, with the, the, the genomic revolution, one is ending up doing all this, you know, fussy, uh, stuff anyway, but I really didn't like doing molecular biology. I thought it was really boring and I wanted to do stuff with whole organisms, which I guess that part of it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. he was still, again, just interested and um, a great teacher and very, you know, kind. So yeah. that helped a lot. Yeah. So did you do honeybee stuff? 
with no, um, Leonard, so, or was so he off that by now? He was off of that uh, by the time I was an undergrad, and that was, you know, still, he was working on crabs and things like that, and so I didn't do any work. Um, uh, and people didn't, people in organismal biology didn't tend to have, you know, big armies of undergraduates working in their lab so much. I did, let's see, I did some stuff as an undergrad, um, working for Bill Murdoch, who's the ecologist, uh, um, who was looking at predator, um, switching from one prey type to another. And so I spent an inordinate amount of time, um, uh, watching as, uh, notonected, uh, you know, water beetles, uh, did or didn't eat bloodworms or da- or uh, Drosophila that you dropped in the water. Um, and, you know, mostly what I liked about that was getting to hang around the marine lab where mm-hmm. there were all these people coming and going at all hours of the day and night, dripping wet, clutching, you know, aquaria, clutching dead fish, clutching live fish, um, and doing all this really interesting. And it just seemed like a really lively and stimulating world to me. Although having said that, I still didn't come out of undergraduate convinced I wanted to go into biology as a profession at all. Right. You said you took three years off yeah, or so doing various yeah. jobs. What what um what eventually drove you to go to grad school then? Um a couple of things. One of them was I mean, I never stopped being interested in biology. Uh and it became clear that by far the best way to pursue that interest was going to be to get an advanced degree that that working in science it's kind of hard i mean you can do it as sort of a side thing but it's harder um and so i've always been interested in writing for instance and for a while i really thought i wanted to do science writing as a career but or or even to just be a writer period but then i decided i really liked the idea i didn't want to just write about just stuff i wanted to have something to write about and that seemed like Going into science was going to be the best way to do that, and certainly maintaining an interest in writing and literature on the side is way and being a scientist as your profession is way easier than the reverse, where you're going into literature and then trying to what have a lab in your garage. I mean, it's really pretty difficult the other way. So I'm I'm yeah. kind of glad I settled I, I settled on that. Yeah. Uh, wow. So you basically fulfilled what you wanted to do since you graduated college. Well, kind of. I mean, yeah. 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 You're a pretty successful writer. And also ultra successful scientist. Well, I yeah, I, I you yeah. know it, some days are better than others. But yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, well, I'll, yeah. I'm, I'll say it then. Uh, um, as as we now are, you know, as as we all are, are waiting with bated breath to hear from NSF on our proposals, then you know, like some days really are better than others. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, actually, well, okay. So on NSF proposals, like, do you? Um, I mean, couldn't you write that uh, Paleo Fantasy is sort of a broader impacts of your last NSF grant? Oh, kind what of. What do you think um, about yeah. that? I mean, because it really <laughs> so, is, so, don't yeah. you think? So it's an interesting, that, that's an interesting point. So, so uh, you know, NSF always wants to have broader impacts that go into your proposals. Um, a, a slight problem I've run into, which is sort of funny, is that I feel like I do do a ton of outreach, and I'm really interested in talking to the public, and I am lucky enough to have had a pretty... Um, a good audience for in a good platform for a lot of what I do. So I'm now, again, aforementioned, you know, do sex and animal behavior. And so I'm now like a go to person when someone has a question about gay animals, like, God help me. Yeah. Um, I, well, you know, apparently it's a niche. Uh-huh. Uh, and um, so, you know, I do get so so I'm set up sort of like that. And what I sometimes get from the panelists at NSF is well, but that's stuff you're doing anyway. So, you know, having that be the broader impact, you know, they, they want me to do something specifically with the proposal. And I often feel a little nettled at that because it's like, well, okay, so I could stop, you know, if the New York Times calls, I'll stop talking to them, but you want me to what, develop a website that no one's going to read? I, yeah. I like, I mean, not to, right. not to diss websites. I mean, no. seriously, you know, really, yeah. Adrian, not to diss websites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but so sometimes it gets in this catch 22 where since I'm already doing it, they sort of feel like that doesn't really count for the broader impacts for the particular proposal I'm writing. So I've, I've yeah, but you do it well, and like, why would you well, want to stop yeah. doing something that well, you're already? Well, you know, and, and I'm not. I mean, and you know, uh, you know I and I, I do really enjoy it. One of the fun th- things too is that I and I really do encourage anybody who is kind of toying with it is that I think working with science for the public is super fun because you get to, first of all, read a bunch of stuff that you would never ordinarily let yourself read because it's too far away from your actual scientific research. So for the Paleo Fantasy book, I did read all this anthropology, which I didn't know that much about before, and and it was super interesting and really a fun, you know, 
fun aspect to learn about. Um, and then the second thing is you get to meet all these people that you would never otherwise meet uh, and who are also often really interesting. And it stops you from being so narrow, which I think is a real risk in being a professional scientist, is that there's so much focus on being extremely um, – narrow about, you know, your field of research, and you've got to constantly be thinking about your next proposal, and you're constantly thinking about, you know, your next paper. And you don't often get an opportunity to talk to people about the bigger picture. And so I really like that part of yeah. working with, you know, science communication or the public or whatever you yeah. call it. Yeah, I mean, I think it really affects our job. I mean, it affects, you know, perception of what we do um, and what our field is and how that's useful on a broader scale. I think it's really important, you know, part of what we do. Um, what, so you just mentioned, uh, doing, uh, a bunch of reading in, in anthropology and biological anthropology for this latest book. Was, was paleo fantasy the first time that you did experiential? Like, could you write in the beginning of paleo fantasy that you went to an ancient DNA lab? Like, oh, well, I, so I was doing that anyway. That wasn't for the book. Actually. Oh, it wasn't? Really? No, it was just, well, I was, I was in Sweden cause I, I, I've got a lot of colleagues there and I, um, Teach a, I sometimes teach an evolutionary biology and, and gender course, a short course there for graduate students. And so I was there anyway, um, but I knew I, I was thinking about the book. And so I, so there's a bunch of people there who work on ancient DNA. And so that was how I got to go visit the lab, which was just amazing. Oh. I mean, I would have gone anyway, yeah, even if sure. I wasn't writing the book. Okay, yeah, Cause, yeah. Because who wouldn't want to go? I mean, I, you know, like I touched a 16,000-year-old bone. Yeah. I mean, through gloves, through gloves. All but, right. you know, like. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, you know, how amazing is that? So. Yeah. So, huh. so yeah, I mean, I, I, that's just one of the, the fun things about being a scientist is that, you know, people will share all this stuff with you. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so that's actually the third thing that was, so there's the, that you get to talk to fun people, you get to read a lot of cool stuff. And I think, um, working on books has reinforced my, um, feeling of uh, that scientists are amazingly generous, that I'm, at least in my field. And so I can essentially cold call anybody in the world and say, Hey, I'm working on a book about whatever it is, um, and I found out that you're doing something a little bit related to that. Could you tell me a little bit more, or can you tell me how you got, or I'll just ask them for something that would be related to the book. And people are just uniformly really, really kind and happy to share stuff with you and will send you unpublished manuscripts and send you, you know, stories and photos and anecdotes and tell you about, you know, how they, they you know, met their spouse while on a field trip and, I, you know, just all kinds of stuff. And I, I feel like people who are not in science or at least, again, not my field of science, it's not like that. Like I, my impression is that people in other disciplines tend to be a, little, a lot more guarded about what they do. And, yeah. and I really love that people will say, oh, look at this great, cool thing that I just did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so let's flip back to, to graduate school. Uh, you ended up at University of Michigan. Um, was, was that where you wanted to go? Did uh, yeah. you apply specifically to work with Bill Hamilton? I didn't. So I did not. I applied thinking I might. So Michigan, at least at that time, had a very um, sort of generic application. So you applied to go into the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Um, but people, it wasn't that they were actively discouraged from having a putative advisor, but they certainly weren't, it certainly wasn't a prerequisite at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, they wanted to know that there was someone there that would fit with your interests, but, but it wasn't something that, that you were required to do. And I went thinking I might end up working with uh, Dick Alexander, who oh, yeah. is a, um, also a, a you know, evolutionary, and, and, and worked on crickets, although the cricket thing for me came later. Uh, but, um, he, by that time, had really gotten much more interested in evolution and human behavior, which really, despite my latest book, is not what I do kind of for my bread and butter. Uh, and um, also, I ended up finding stuff in common with what Hamilton was doing. And so Hamilton was only at Michigan for a few years, um, which is when I, but well, which is when I became uh, a grad student. Uh, there. Right. So you, did you work with him all throughout your master's and PhD then? So he, uh, so I think he started in 1978. I came in 1980 and he left to go to Oxford in 1984. But by then I was already far enough along that there wasn't an option for me to go to, I mean, and, and I'm in retrospect, I'm really glad. I think Oxford would have been a really difficult place to be, mm -hmm. particularly for a woman, um, particularly that maybe particularly then maybe ever, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so uh, I finished up while he was at Oxford and then he and I did spend a little bit of time there and then he came back for my defense and mm -hmm. and uh, so forth. But yeah, Michigan was an amazing place to 
be a graduate student. Um, yeah. Partly because the faculty was extraordinary, partly because the other grad students from whom I think one learns a lot, if not most, of what one learns in graduate school were amazing. And, yeah. Uh, Did you have any famous uh, uh, grad school uh, colleagues? Yeah, sure. This that is turned uh, out to be famous biologists. A lot of the uh, so Peter Grant was there when I was there, and that was when a lot of the that was when the El Nino happened um, in the Galapagos, and so or well, I mean, it happened everywhere, but that was when the El Nino resulted in all those cool. Well, he was changes. there as faculty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So he was there before uh -huh. he went before he went to uh, Princeton. Yeah. And uh, so he. Um, yeah, uh, he was on actually he was on my committee and uh, then he left and so for a while I had kind of a reputation as a typhoid Mary of graduate students that people were asking me to take people on my committee so they would then leave um, because I had Bill and then he left and then I had asked Peter to be Peter was on my committee and I asked I had asked Peter to sort of step in and uh, Bill's absence and then Peter left and so you know um, they started thinking that maybe if I would take on some of the more problematic members that they would leave too but that obviously didn't really work out uh -huh. um, anyway and so so a lot of Peter's students so Dolph Schluter and Trevor Price. Um, were grad students when I was a grad student. Um, Nancy Moran uh, was also a grad student uh, of Bill's um, along with me, although she was really? uh, somewhat senior to me. Huh. Yeah. Well, and it's pretty funny because I, the stuff that she and I, and we're really close friends, but the stuff yeah. that she and I do is completely different. Right. Um, and uh, wow. I, I think it just goes to show there's lots of places you can go if you have an interest in evolution. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I think I read an anecdote from you sort of explaining a little bit uh a little window into how bill hamilton sort of worked and how his mind works um he there was something about like a woodblock model with like screws <laughs> and bike spokes and something like yeah, what is so, that so, so well so he was a of course a you know a theoretic he i think he was um part of why he was such a, an amazing scientist is that he was a theoretician who who nonetheless had an extremely keen interest in and knowledge about the natural world mm -hmm. so that he was always very aware of what real organisms really did that said when he thought about things he tended to think about them in theory and in either math or kind of graphical format uh, and when we were working on parasite host interactions and their effect on sexual selection, and then he had been interested in parasite host interactions, of course, in the evolution of sex itself. Um, at one point, he constructed this model that was supposed to illustrate the way parasite and host genotypes interacted in these stable limit cycles over time. And so it was basically a a square block of wood with four long uh, screws at each corner, well, with a, a long screw at each corner, and then you could um, sort of uh, make um, l these little nuts go up and down on each of the screws, and there were um, two sets of four nuts each, one for the host and one for the parasite genotype, and they were painted different colors. And God, I can't believe I remember this. Uh, and um, then you had them at different levels, and then you put a rubber band around on top of each set of screws, so you you ended up with two planes, each representing the different. So you'd have two genes with two alleles each. One, uh, it's, both the host and the parasite would have two genes with two alleles each. And so then you were supposed to lay two bicycle spokes, one for the host and one for the parasite, on top of each of the planes. And this was going to show you how the genotypes interacted in the population. And so I can't believe it. I've just given like actually what's a pretty <laughs> like that. That is actually what it looked like, and, yeah. and it's it's a pretty. And the only problem was I had no idea idea like what it actually meant. I mean, I knew what each of the parts was. So you had two alleles in each of two loci was susceptible and resistant um, for the, you know, host and the parasite. Uh, and then the genes were interacting. And I can explain it verbally. Like I, I, I do know what a limit cycle is. Uh -huh. um, but I really didn't get about the different heights of the screws on the or the different heights of the nuts on the screws and, you know, anyway, how it all worked. So yeah. he, he tried really hard with that, and then um, it just never really went anywhere. But he, he he had a workshop in his garage, and he really used to like building these things out of out of. Uh, out did of he build that? Did he build that to show, to demonstrate it to you to, for, visually, well, or yeah. did he do it to, like, sort of have something to work with for himself? Well, oh, no, I don't think he needed it for himself. I think he was trying to show this to people, you yeah. know, in general. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was that. He built another. There was another one too. Now I can't remember what that was supposed to be for. He also used to talk about how um, linkage disequilibrium can be best understood if you think about water sloshing about in a bathtub, which I still remember as uh -huh. again a completely useless analogy for me. Um, 
uh, now that I kind of know what linkage disequilibrium is, I can kind of see what he meant because, you know, what it is is that you have things at both ends of the bathtub. And so if something goes up at one side, even if you're not doing anything to make the other side go down, it'll go down anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. Does that help you at all? I, you know. No, I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> no. So so anyway, um, yeah, I, it's it's one of those verbal versus visual thinkers, yeah. and I'm really a pretty verbal thinker, um, yeah. and not so much with the graphical yeah. stuff. Yeah, so. <laughs> I see. So um, your your graduate work with was was with crickets, but not with the cricket system that you work with now. Right. Primarily. Yeah, I worked with local crickets in Michigan, um, yeah. although also with parasites, and I I fixed on them largely because. Um, it was so I, I did want to do something with parasite host interactions and sexual selection, and so I toyed a little bit with working on birds, um, and in fact uh, spent part of a summer trying to uh, miss net swallows because I was I mean I'm still a, kind of a bird person and um, yeah I was trying to do and I still think this would be a cool project looking at parasites of um, swallows are an interesting group because they've got uh, some members the closely related members that are monomorphic bright, some the sexes are monomorphic bright, some with the uh, monomorphic uh, dull, and some with highly sexually dimorphic. And it would be really, I still think it'd be really interesting to look at the relationship between parasites and the degree of dichromatism in different kinds of swallows. And so I was doing that and tried to trap a bunch of swallows and um, stick them in plastic bags with their heads sticking out and with ether in the bottom of the plastic bag. So that, that suppose, what, what this supposedly does is make all the ectoparasites fall out. Um, it didn't really work all that well. Uh, anyway, I messed around with that and then eventually realized that insects are so much better for doing, especially lab work with, and I really did want to do some lab work. Oh, yeah, I also thought about doing MHC stuff in mice because mm -hmm. um, the work looking at MHC um, incompatibility and partner uh, choice in mice had just started coming out and Bill was really interested in it and then I got interested in it but I really didn't want to spend my entire dissertation working on in the lab on mus musculus because it sounded really boring yeah um, again I did a little project on it but kind of rejected that uh, and so then I decided okay I want an animal that produces a sexual signal that's an insect and that gets parasites and the sexual signal part acoustic signals are way easier to analyze than visual signals or chemical signals, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and so singing insects seemed like an obvious choice. And I spent part of a summer um, running around dissecting all the crickets and katydids and grasshoppers I could find uh, and looking for parasites and eventually settled on just regular field crickets um, yeah. and some parasites. And that's what I did my, that's what I did my dissertation on. But, and so the other thing is like, I, I so did not go into graduate school knowing what I wanted to do for a dissertation project. I so did not. And sometimes I think that's a luxury that we almost don't give students much anymore. Yeah. That, what, how does that translate to the experience your students have? Yeah. I mean, I, I just think it's harder because graduate programs are more structured and because um, graduate school seems to have become much more competitive. Um, people need to have had all this research experience. Lots of them are coming into grad school with publications. Uh, so I don't know. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's I think you could probably argue it both ways, whether it works better one way or the other, because it's also true that Michigan was a place where a lot of graduate students floundered because there wasn't a lot of direction on what to do. And Bill was not exactly the kind of advisor that would, you know, handhold you through devising your project because he just figured people who were passionate about what they were doing would figure it out and get there, which I think is not always true. I mean, I, you know, it worked okay in my case, but I, I think it isn't always true. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't really have a lot invested in one approach versus the other. I think they can all work. Yeah. I mean, don't you have grad students that, I mean, all your grad students don't work on or haven't worked on just your cricket systems. Right. Absolutely. Like, didn't um, you have I, a crab? I did actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've had students working on lizards and birds and crabs and all kinds of stuff. And I, as I always tell them, I think the cost, there's costs and benefits. And the, the benefit to working in my system is that I can give you a lot more logistical help and I'm more likely to help you with funding because my grant is to do the stuff in the crickets. But, um, you know, if you want to do something else, I'm happy to help. It's just you're going to have to do more of the the sort of basic, you know, nuts and bolts of it. Um, mm -hmm. And for a lot of students, that's worked okay. For some students, it, it is really difficult. And so, you know, I don't know if they would say they should have done it that way or not. I, yeah. 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 So um, somewhere in between uh, being at Riverside and um, 
Well, maybe it was when you got to Riverside and graduate school. You you started working with uh, your two sort of main study systems that you held for a while: the jungle fowl and the Hawaiian island crickets. Yeah. Right? So yeah. How, did, how did you? Get those so the, the jungle, uh, red jungle fowl um, was what I did for my postdoc. So I was a postdoc oh, okay. at the University of New Mexico uh, working with Dave Ligon and Randy Thornhill. Uh-huh. And um, they had already had a project that they'd come up with um, looking again at in part at the effect of parasites and sexual selection, but also at female choice and doing some some what were at the time, I think, really innovative experiments to try and figure out what traits females preferred, whether male competition and female choice acted in concert or were opposed and a bunch of other stuff. And so Dave Ligon is kind of a, a poultry and, and game fowl person from way back. And Randy Thornhill was interested in, you know, sexual selection and a big, you know, uh, leader in the field there. And so the two of them at New Mexico decided to collaborate. They got an NSF grant. I had been uh, corresponding with Randy about actually the possibility of working on house finches because I had gotten mm. interested in carotenoids and mm-hmm. their role in sexual selection. Um, so he was willing to sponsor me in an NSF postdoc proposal for that uh, uh, research. And then um, their, the postdoc that they had on the grant got a job. And so they had an opening and Randy called me up and said, how about chickens? And I, you know, initially it was like, really, chickens? Um, uh, but, you know, a job's a job. A uh, postdoc is a postdoc, as you know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like one does not turn down something like that. And so um, so I went to do that. And I really quickly, uh, you know, developed this great, uh, you know, fondness for the system. And it was it was just a, f- a fab. And I loved the University of New Mexico. It was a really fun place to work. Uh, and I wonderful colleagues there. Uh, Bill Rice was there at the time um, uh, before he uh, went to California and, there were lots and lots of. Were you working with people. with popu- with like captive populations, yeah, in the, or so, were you going so, to Southeast Asia? To no, track I was these not going down? to Southeast Asia, and that's actually related to how I got into the the cricket stuff because um, so both Randy and Dave had big uh, uh, properties outside of of Albuquerque, and they each kept uh, birds on their you know at home uh, essentially uh, in um, these you know. A-frame uh, cages and various pens and so on and so forth. And like I said, Dave had been keeping poultry all his life. Uh, and so he was really the, the guy who knew about that part of it. Um, and so it was, it was, it was fab. So I went to, you know, we were, we were, I used to joke with people, it wasn't really field work. It certainly wasn't lab work. It was kind of yard work um, <laughs> because you were just outside, you know, doing stuff um, yeah. with the birds and, and it worked. Uh, it was a really fun project. It worked really well. And then when I went to Riverside to take my faculty position, I initially had thought I would just focus on insects again, but the the jungle fowl are a really cool system, and it's they're great because on the one hand they're not chickens; they haven't been domesticated. We got our birds from the San Diego Zoo, which had had feral jungle fowl for many years because they'd been introduced um, and then just allowed to roam free, and they mostly had not interbred with domestic poultry. So in a, in effect, you've got like this wild pheasant from Southeast Asia, but um, on the other hand, you can use all of the information and the vast, you know, literature about domestic poultry, and so it's the best of both both worlds. So it was, it was a it was a really great system for studying sexual selection. So I did that for quite a long time um, yeah. at Riverside as well. And then the 1991 meeting of the Society for Study of Evolution was in Hilo in Hawaii, and I thought, you know, well, you know, I may as well try and do something. Um, you know, else besides just going to the meeting, I'd never been to Hawaii. Uh, and so I thought, well, you know, I could, um, check out there's, but there was, I, I had heard that there were feral jungle fowl on the island of Kauai, uh, and, um, that there were a lot in this place called Koke State Park, which is true. Um, I mean, there are, uh, and so I thought, well, I could check those out and maybe that would be a place that I could do field work that would be a little bit more natural than, you know, just having them in, you know, our, captive sites, but that mm. wouldn't require me to, you know, have to work in Cambodia or, you know, something like that. And so I wanted to try and do that. And then I thought, well, okay. And then the other thing that would be worth doing is seeing if there's anything I can do with crickets and parasites. I, I always tell people, you know, now looking back on it, why I thought I couldn't just, why, why I didn't think I could have just stayed in Hawaii and like actually done something recreational, I don't know. But, <laughs> but somehow I was convinced that the thing to do was to therefore, you know, find all this other, you know, sciencey stuff to do. I mean, it's fine. I'm not, uh, uh, anyway, and so I also um, heard from uh, Chris Boak, who'd been a postdoc in Hawaii, that there were all these Telegrillus oceanicus crickets that had been introduced to Hawaii, and that those would be pretty easy to work on. So I thought, okay, well, that's that's two things. Uh, so we, I decided to do the 
crickets before and then the jungle fowl after. And the jungle fowl was a bust because um, the minute I walked out of the car, I stepped out of the car on uh, Kauai, you can tell that all the, their jungle fowl are completely interbred with domestic poultry. They, they uh-huh. look, you know... Well, I should, it's a value judgment, but as a yeah. jungle fowl person, they look terrible. Yeah. Um, and they've got all this white plumage, and they look really domesticated. And so I thought, well, that's never going to work for a model for what jungle fowl behavior is like. So I wrote that off pretty quickly. But the cricket project turned out to pan out. Um, and uh, I just, but I, it was really happenstance, and I really stumbled onto what turned into a really cool system to work in. Um, and we've been working in it ever since. Yeah. Do you seem to like that system has revealed a lot of things to you and a lot of like I, the story that you tell about uh, being on vacation in mid 2000s or whatever and then noticing that when, in one island all the crickets were basically silent well so no we were not on vacation that was when oh, we okay. were still we, we were still working on the oh, project and uh-huh. but what had happened was that um so i'd already we'd already discovered that the crickets in hawaii get a an acoustically orienting parasitoid fly. And so, so I'd, I'd been studying that for years, but what had been happening was that on Kauai, which is the island where the prevalent prevalence of the parasitoid was the highest, the population had just been plummeting. And I thought, well, you know, it's an introduced system because both the fly and the cricket are introduced to Hawaii. I, okay. It's an introduced system. It's not stable. You know, these things happen. They're going to go extinct. Um, and when we went in, and I'd had graduate students working there and stuff, and then I went in, uh, 2001 and like managed through a lot of work to collect like three females to lay eggs for the lab colony and um because i have them all um here in my lab mm-hmm. i've managed to get like three females to lay eggs in, for the lab colony i'd heard like one male and i thought well okay this is it um and so i didn't go in 2002 and then in 2003 we went um and again i'd, I'd been doing you know rate i'd been making regular field visits on the site but then in 2003 uh that was when um we still didn't hear anything, but you figure, well, you may as well get out of the car. And uh, then all of a sudden there were all these crickets all over the place, but they were completely silent, which, as I have always pointed out to people, like, see, if you're a cricket person, that's like a deeply, um, yeah. you know, unnerving experience because, you know, what crickets are supposed to do is call. And if it's at night and they're crickets, then they should be calling. And it was night and they were crickets and they weren't calling. And so it was like this moment of cognitive dissonance. Um, and uh, That must have been exciting, though. It was, well, it took us a while to figure out kind of what was going on. Oh. Um, but, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, but see, and at first I thought that what it was was that there had been, they were behaviorally refraining from calling, uh, which, you know, of course, would protect them from this fly, which only uses the call to find the host. But then it turned out, and this was, of course, even more exciting, that actually there had been rapid evolution in wing morphology, and they exhibit what we call flat wing, which is this trait that makes them unable, it, it messes up their stridulatory apparatus so they can't call. Um, which was really very um, extraordinary and not something we were expecting at all. Right. And so I calculate, like, okay, let's assume I missed it starting in maybe the late 90s um, because I did have a, a student uh, out there, Gita Kolaru, who's now a professor at the um, at uh, Cal Poly uh, San Luis Obispo, and she um, told me at one point, well, you know, I'm having, Marlene, I'm having trouble telling the males from the females, and I just thought, oh, my God, you know, you've just been out in Hawaii too long. I mean, it's really not hard to tell. But it, it's it's true if you look at the wings, you know, they, they, of these flat wings, they look like they have um, female-like wings. And so I've, I've always wondered whether it started then, uh, um, and yeah. we just didn't pay any attention. Because, of course, like, who picks up every cricket they see and scrutinizes the wings? Because why right. would you? Right. Um, so anyway, but even assuming it started in the late 90s, and was well established by 2003 that's you know say five years they have three to four generations a year that's less than 20 generations which is pretty amazing for yeah the the rap for this the the almost complete but not quite complete uh spread of this single gene so. uh-huh uh-huh yeah it's really cool it's a really cool discovery um in the last couple of minutes i want to get to your books too sure um uh so let's let's talk about your your first book was on um was sexual selections i think what we can and can't learn about sex from animals wow very title. good yeah, I, yeah right? I, I like think, the book I, a lot I, I don't even think my editor would remember the title yeah that's right <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that was and that was super fun because again that was an outgrowth of my interest in animals and sex and behavior right. and, and also in feminism because it really seemed to me that so many of the people that i knew that were interested in women's issues and women's rights um dismissed biology as you know something that was either dangerous or you know 
being used by people to rationalize all kinds of stuff about, you know, gender stereotypes. And I felt like that was not the biology that I knew. And so it was interesting to me that they felt like that at the same time. I felt like a lot of my scientist colleagues um, were surprised at the idea that the science they did was anything other than just objective and cut and dried and, you know, that it could be subject to bias seemed really surprising to them. And so I wanted to write the book as a way to kind of steer between those two. Yeah, I thought it was great. And um, you had been writing about feminism and sort of gender bias uh, for a while before that book, right? A little bit, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that book was sort of um, an outgrowth of one of the major areas that you'd like to yeah to work so in. So I, I had yeah. been interested in it for a really long time. Yeah, yeah. I like the book because it's, it's it to me it, like it, it really took a stance and it was really like I'm going to advance the field both professionally for behavioral ecologists and also present it to the public in a way that sort of advances the way that they one might think about that sort of research and, and things like oh, well, that. Th well, thanks, because yeah. exa that is exactly what I was trying to do. And of course, because the big danger of trying to sort of stretch a hand out in each direction is that everybody will rebuff you because everybody thinks, you know, that you're not doing it right. Um, oh, I thought so, it was great. So, yeah, that was... That I thought was it, yeah, because really it, it wasn't just, you know, presenting... It wasn't, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't one hand to the other. It wasn't just presenting uh, research to the public in sort of a uh, accessible way. It was It was both. It was, you know... All that combined, it was talking to both audiences, which I thought was really great. Um, I wonder what what your experience with that first book was. Did you get what what was the feedback? Um, interesting. I mean, I got again. That was what really made me realize that writing books for an audience other than just other people in my field um, got me meeting a lot of super interesting people, and I got. I, I got to go give a talk on that book to um, a bunch of historians of science at Oregon State University. I remember, and that was that was super fun. Like, who gets to hang out with historians? You know, that was yeah. great. I, you know, mm -hmm. that was so that was a, that so that was that was a lot of fun. Um, certainly, I mean, and let's and so that book was with the University Press and was not exactly like. I mean, it did get reviewed in some reasonably high profile places, which was great, and I was I was really gratified by it. But still, I mean, a book like that is it's not like it's gonna you know outsell Stephen King or something. Right. So it's not like yeah. yeah. Did it did when it was written and you completed your first book, did you were you excited to do another one? Um or was you just sort of like, well, that well, was a so, lot. So uh well but eh, I don't know. I, I mean I like I said, I like writing for the public. I like yeah. doing, you know, lots of different things. Uh I was approached by the person that's now my agent um after uh that book came out and after I'd written some stuff for the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, asking me if I'd ever wanted to write a book for a commercial press, and I was kind of taken aback and says, "I don't know. Like, um, should I? I, you know, I mm -hmm. What's the difference?" Uh, and so, um, and and so then this was the other thing that's been really helpful to me is that um, I have a bunch of kind of writer friends or you know people I refer to as the real writers uh, who um, are again very generous and helpful and tell me all this stuff that I don't know about the world of publishing and what I should think about. And so I actually called up uh, Deborah Blom, who's um, a terrific science writer uh, at uh, University of Wisconsin and has written books about all everything from poisons to monkey research to, you know, everything um, and is, uh, is you know, one of my, my writer role models. Uh, anyway, and I said, so this person just called me up and talked to me about being an agent. Is this like ambulance chasing in lawyers or is this like, you know, like, like, is, is this one of these weird things and I should, I should rebuff her or, yeah. or is it, and she said, no, no, that's okay. You know, people do that. And, and so we had this big conversation about how, how this all would work. And it was, um, Anyway, and so that was partly what got me thinking about trying to do another book um, for uh, for a more um, sort of popular or, or, well, for a commercial press. Yeah. So. Do you have uh, specific people you send drafts to, like writer friends? You know, I don't, I don't really send drafts to people. Um, I certainly have uh, some friends that I've sent, you know, different books. I, you know, have, have you know, vetted different chapters for me uh, for um, – and it depends on, you know, how secure I feel about some of the more technical details. Mm -hmm. uh, I have lots of writers I admire, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have to confess, you know, asking someone to read your entire uh, book is kind of a lot of stuff. I've gotten a lot of help from my editor to be, from my editors, um, actually, to be honest. People in publishing are, are wonderful people who really love books. And, and, oh, and here's something else that people often ask me about doing this is that they, a lot of people are very suspicious of the idea of writing for the public. And they say, oh, well, but aren't you just constantly going to have this pressure to sell out and dumb down what you're doing? And, you know, 
I never have. I mean, I think there are presses that would want you to do that, but my agent doesn't shop my proposals around to that kind of publisher. Um, so yeah, I've never, I've, I've really never had an editor who I felt like was making me, I mean, I mean sometimes they'll say, look, people are not going to understand this. And, and my editor actually at, UC, at the University of California Press, who published Sexual Selections, was fantastic. Um, she's uh, Doris Kretschmer. She's retired now. Uh, but she was great because she had worked for many years in the kind of humanities um, side of UC Press and then had switched to the sciences. And so she was my ideal audience because she did not have a background in science and could, you know, she would send me back a chapter and say, wait, I don't understand, like, how this you know, how this follows from that. And I'd reread it and think, oh, right, of course you wouldn't because you wouldn't have had a genetics class. And so then it would make me realize what I needed to explain. And so that was a huge help in pitching my work to the appropriate level. And, you know, because a lot of people think they have to be incredibly almost condescending. uh, Uh And I think that's not necessary at all. I mean, the world is full of smart people who just happen not to have had a genetics class. It doesn't really... Yeah. Yeah. And you seem to, um, you haven't given up writing about gender bias and, and, uh, behavioral ecology. No, I'm, yeah. I'm still interested in, and as are lots of other people too. So I think it's something that, um, my field is maybe, you know, dare I say it, like slightly more enlightened about than some other science subdisciplines. Uh-huh. Uh, so people are, are definitely interested in the way that our biases about society can affect what we do. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, and so your second and third books were sort of, um, uh, t- uh, it seemed like a taking off point was sort of your study systems and parasites and also in yeah. insects and the close yeah. relatives. Did you feel like, um, paleo fantasy was a, was a, was stepping out on a branch a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the bug book, the sex on six legs was, was just, that was just really fun um, yeah. because it was about, it, you know, although I did struggle with that a little bit because I wanted it not to be just another Bugs Are Cool book because um, the world is full of Bugs Are Cool books. And I I love those books and they're wonderful. And um, I did read uh, Life on a Little Known uh, Planet when I was a kid and thought that was fantastic. Um, but uh, I wanted to write something more than that that was more about how the way that we use insects tells us something about how we think about a lot of things in the world it's you know and and how they really expand our understanding of life in general and you know that they aren't just little people in chitin suits and and so i wanted to write it about that Mm -hmm. um and that was that was actually a lot of fun and i we did struggle a little bit back and forth and plus i had to really stick to my guns on the title for that one because um my editor did not like sex on six legs really Um, yes uh but i got and it's not my title i got it from bill cade who actually is the scientist who first discovered the interaction between acoustically orienting parasitoid flies and crickets although he did it in texas Uh um and who's a fantastic um scientist uh but he'd always wanted to write uh he we were having a conversation once and he said he'd always wanted to write a book about insects called sex on six legs and i said that's the best title ever um you know (laughs) can i can i can i use it and he said sure i'm never going to write this book um so he gave me permission uh and and um, that was the title I wanted to use. Um, and my editor was kind of opposed to it because she pointed out that the book is about more than sex. And as my agent said, oh, come on, you know, Gone with the Wind is not about the weather. Like, we, we, we yeah. don't really need to, you know. Oh, that's a funny line. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Huh. Did you, for your first book, did you want to put feminism in the title? But we're uh, talked out of it? No. Um, let's see. And I didn't want to put the term, and, and, and I wanted to put sex rather than gender um, in yeah. the title because I didn't want to call it uh, what we can learn. Because I felt like the putting the word gender in made it sound too um, academic. Uh-huh. So there okay. was that. Um, okay. But no, I, I really didn't. So it felt like stepping out on a limb a little bit for you, like writing your, your fourth book. Do you think it was more successful because of that? Do you think um, sort of going? So, so, so the first it's a newsflash. Um, let me tell you, it's extremely difficult to figure out whether a book is successful or not. Really? Um, even publishers seem to not know. Uh, and and any writer will tell you this: that you get these completely unintelligible royalty statements, and you have absolutely no idea, um, you know, how successful they are or not. I have more reviews on Amazon um, on the Paleo Fantasy book than my other ones, but I think some of that may be because I seem to have pissed off a lot of the people who are adherents of the Paleo diet, which was totally not my intent. Uh-huh. Um, so okay. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for talking to me. This is really great. I oh, good. It. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Thank thanks. You. Um, you you actually asked some a lot of questions that are really different than what I often get from interviewers. So this is oh, fun good. for me too. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Marlene. <laughs>